Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, Overview of Security 661, ARM Exploit Development, and an Introduction to Router Emulation. My name is Randall Jones. I'm the Offensive Operations Marketing Manager here at SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is John DeGreuter. John has over two decades in the technology field, experience that he now uses to help others learn and pursue their passions in the field as well. He's authored and taught a Windows kernel primer course for DerbyCon and Black Hat. He's been a guest lecturer at John Hopkins University. He has authored and taught a computer network defense course for the George Washington University. And he's now brought his considerable experience to SANS authoring this new Security 661 ARM exploit course. Uh, which we'll be hearing about during this session. So uh, if you have any questions for John during the webcast, please enter them into the questions window at any time. Please note that our webcast is being recorded and will be available for viewing later in the SANS webcast registration page, as well as in your SANS account under my webcast. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, John. Okay, great. Thank you, Randall. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, attending. Uh, today we're going to be doing an overview of the new, brand new ARM exploit development course, SEC661. And also we'll be doing a, a technical segment on uh, router emulation. So I'm really happy to uh, get this kicked off. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump right into it. So ARM is everywhere. They're measuring the new devices that are coming out in the, in the hundreds of billions, right? So uh, these types of processors, uh, we're wearing them on our wrist, we're carrying them around in our pocket, we're driving around in them in our cars. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's everywhere. So uh, this class focuses a lot on the IoT or the Internet of Things. Um, <clears throat> our day two, we, we actually emulate a Netgear and a D-Link router. And uh, the focus of this course is uh, on the fundamentals of ARM exploit development. And we, we look at uh, IoT because uh, in some of the consumer products that are out there, there's not a lot of focus on <clears throat> security for these products. So a lot of um, bugs that, um, you know, from years ago are, are still present in some of these devices and, and they're not implementing all of the security controls that are available with ARM as well. So, so this class uh, is a two day course. We focus on day one on fundamentals. So <clears throat> fundamentals is in uh, the Windows kernel uh, course that I wrote and also in this ARM exploit class, we, we focus a lot on these fundamentals. So day one, we start off with uh, the different tools we need to work with ARM, um, <clears throat> cross-compiling, emulation, and debugging. Uh, and then once we have that kind of under our belt, we, we look at assembly and we, we go through some assembly instructions. But, but for this course, it's, we, we say in the prerequisites that you should have some intermediate experience with assembly and um, we really want to emphasize that because uh, we get down into the weeds pretty quickly. Uh, once we kind of go over some of the basics and the fundamentals, we, we look at the stack and we look at uh, how the stack works, why we have it. We talk about um, passing arguments on the stack. We talk about how it stores local variables and and the, the prologue and epilogue of the stack. And then from there, getting that uh, fundamental understanding allows us to transition into stack overflows and these types of bugs that allow us to uh, gain control of ex execution and, and write exploits. Uh, we look at, uh, at the end of day one, we look at exploit uh, mitigations as well. Um, this this is kind of breaking out day one. This table of contents, I believe, is, is available in the, um, uh, the uh, advertisement for the course, but I wanted to bring it up here as well to, to show it to see if you have uh, any questions about this. Um, 
we go over Ghidra a little bit at the end of day one. We touch on it. You don't need Ghidra or Ida Pro uh, for this class, but it is. Uh, we go over it in case um, you want to, if you, in case you haven't seen it before and you want to dig in and do some reverse engineering or some additional work on some of the, the binaries that we use in the labs or some of the routers themselves. The first day, ARM exploit fundamentals, the labs, a little bit about those. Um, it's kind of a tiered approach with the labs. We have the labs that we work on in class. And uh, in addition to that, there's some uh, bonus labs that are kind of above and beyond. Um, so you're not necessarily um, expected to be able to complete all the labs and the bonus labs, but if one of the segments is something you've seen before or looked at before, you can kind of move on into, into the bonus lab material. If not, uh, you can do it for homework. In addition to that, in addition to the labs and bonus labs, there's also challenges. So at the end of some of the labs, I think there's one in day one and maybe three or four in day two. So at the end of some of those labs, there are challenges. Uh, and these challenges, um, are kind of above and beyond what we go over in class, but it is kind of the progression and the next step. So it's it's kind of for you to uh, take it a little bit further and kind of test what you've learned in class and kind of, you might have to do some Googling or, or figuring out how to work some of the challenge, but those are mixed in there as well. So there's plenty of work, um, hands-on work for, for the students to do. Um, the uh, there is an answer key for the lab so if you if you want to look there's a step-by-step -step walkthrough on how to solve those as well uh, day two uh, we get into exploiting iot devices uh, like i mentioned before we look at a couple of emulated routers uh, we begin day two with shellcode uh, this is kind of a, a continuation from day one uh, shellcode is important uh, because this is what you're going to be running on the on the target. Um, so it's good to have an understanding of what it's actually doing. Um, in addition, we look at bad characters and how how you might have to find some workarounds for bad characters. So there's a, a bonus lab in there for that as well. From there, we we get into the firmware for some of the IoT devices and how we can look at that firmware and pull things apart and uh, get what we need out of that. From there, we move into router emulation and that section is what we're going to be going over in the technical segment of this webcast. Um, so we'll take a look at that kind of uh, after going over through this overview. Next is the net, we'll look at a Netgear exploit and uh, when, when discussions of this class first came up, uh, it was last July, July 2020. Um, <clears throat> you know, I wanted to see if these types of bugs were still relevant. If um, you know, if you know, if this class makes sense, right? Um, in fact, uh, in July 2020, I just started looking for examples to use in class, and this this net Netgear exploit is was less than a month old at the time, so. Um, it was uh, disclosed in June of 2020. So, yeah. So the 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 lab that we work on here is was less than a month old when this course was written. So it's it's pretty relevant. There's still a lot of these types of bugs that exist in these uh, embedded type IoT systems. Uh, next, we look at ROP, Return Oriented Programming. We cover that in depth, uh, and then do a lab on that. There's a uh, a challenge with that one as well. Uh, and then from there, we go into a uh, D-Link exploit. And the D-Link uh, exploit is a little bit older, but it does use ROP. So it's kind of a, a nice progression to apply what we learned in the previous section and um, in what a real world scenario would look like. From there, we look at 64-bit uh, ARM. <clears throat> we look at the differences, but we also look at the similarities. There's a lot of similarities with, in what we do with 32-bit ARM as far as exploit development. And we, we look at that and we work with um, cross-compiling 
uh, debugging, looking at shell code. There's a um, stack-based buffer overflow that we exploit in the 64-bit uh, lab. From there, we kind of wrap up uh, with memory leaks and we talk about exploit mitigations at the end of day one. Um, one of those exploit mitigations is ASLR or address space layout randomization. So uh, we take that and we figure out given a memory leak, this is a stage leak in a lab exercise, but given a memory leak, how can you take that information and uh, use that and build upon that to craft an exploit that gets you around ASLR? So uh, we talk about that and that's, that's a lot. There's a, a lot of material that's packed into this uh, two-day course. We get uh, down in the weeds pretty, pretty quickly with all of this. Um, before taking any questions about the course uh, uh, overview, I wanted to go over the lab environment and just kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. <clears throat> the students get a, uh, a virtual machine that they download. That is the uh, Hammerhead uh, virtual machine. That's just the name of it. Uh, it runs on uh, x86-64 uh, virtualized. So you can open this up in VMware Workstation or VMware Fusion. But from within that Hammerhead VM, we start up uh, using QMU, we start up some additional virtual machines that are based on ARM emulation. So we have three <clears throat> virtual machines that we work with in class. Um, that are ARM VMs that we work out of. In addition to that, uh, there are two emulated routers that we work with on day two. There's a, a Netgear emulated router and a D-Link emu emulated router. And um, we spin all that up within the Hammerhead virtual machine. And we'll talk in the next section about uh, how that works. Um, so also uh, in Hammerhead, there's some scripts that allow you to uh, create some additional ARM-based VMs um, that you can do on your own and, and just spin those up. The idea behind this kind of setup is that uh, the student has kind of everything they need to, in like a, a self-contained way to, to work with ARM and you can work with this material or build up, build it off your own. It's all scripted um, so that things, uh, you're just running one or two commands to get all this stuff uh, fired up. So that was really quick um, on the, the overview. So I'm ready to take any questions, Randall, if you, if you have those on, on the two-day course. Um, so yeah. Yeah, right now, uh, we just have one come in that was about the day one overview, which was what is TLV? I don't think you spelled it out. Right, yeah, uh, great question. TLV stands for type length value. Um, so that's just a, a common format. We, we, we talk about it in the course, um, but um, <clears throat> you, you may see packets that have this um, type of structure. Uh, it might be, for example, one byte that describes the type, one byte that describes the length, and then the value. So this is just a data structure, you might see it in a packet, you might see it in a file format, um, but instead of just uh, throwing in uh, input at the command line, this allows you to work with a, a data structure that you have to populate correct, correctly to overflow the buffer and get a working exploit. Does that answer the question? I believe so. And uh, just for my own curious curiosity, if you had to estimate the amount of time that's wrapped up in those bonus labs, how, how many hours would you say? Oh man, uh, good question. It's probably probably another probably another uh, I don't know two to four hours more um, more if you're kind of exploring around with the bonus labs, um, and not just these, but throughout. Uh, the rest of the course with cool. the challenges included. If there are any other questions, please go ahead and enter them as we go along. We'll uh, come back around to them at the end as well. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so next we're gonna talk about router emulation and, and how to get this going and, and how to get these emulated devices spun up. The idea, um, since we're 
uh, talking about attacking IoT devices is to take uh, a physical device, so a Netgear router in this example, and emulate it so that we can have it up and running in our on our on our laptop, and that we can interact with it and uh, look for bugs in it or write exploits for it uh, in a more controlled environment than having to work with an actual device. Um, so we, one of the things we want to think about is what we want to attack. And in these examples, we're attacking web-based services. So we want to um, get it to the point where all of the web services, services start up and we can interact with those services um, just like we would with a real device, but in an emulated environment. As you're doing this and as you're figuring it out, there's a lot of errors that are going to occur when you're when you're trying to get it to start up. And a lot of those errors stem from the fact that we're not running on a physical device and it's looking for uh, the Wi-Fi hardware, the USB um, drive, other other types of things that it's expecting to see, but it's not there because we're running it uh, emulated and not on the actual hardware. So you're going to see a lot of errors as long as those errors don't prevent it from booting and um, allow you to interact with the services as you normally would on a physical device, that's fine. So you'll see that as we kind of start one of these things up. Uh, based on that, you, you've got to kind of do some reverse engineering and see what's breaking it um, so that you can find workarounds for that or, or bypass, bypass that to get it to boot up all the way. So there's some uh, reverse engineering involved for getting this initially started up. Uh, the kernel, it doesn't have to match exactly what you have running on the device. Ideally, you want to make it uh, similar. Um, that might involve downloading you know, the source code for the kernel, configuring it, and combi compiling a, a kernel with uh, similar settings. Usually that's much older kernels, um, but it doesn't have to be. If you're interacting with the, the user services, um, you don't necessarily need that. Um, there, there might be some differences. One of the examples of one of the differences I saw uh, when I was using a newer kernel, uh, like we do, uh, uh, as you'll see in the rest of the example, is that the shared objects, when ASLR is turned on, they get loaded at different addresses as as they would with an older kernel. So things like that that are that are kind of separate from the bugs in the software themselves, but can be important if you're trying to attack a real device. So that's just some, some things to keep in mind. So uh, starting with the blank slate, as we talked about before, we're working out of a the Hammerhead virtual machine. It's x86-64, um, but we want to initially start off with an ARM-based VM. Again, we do this with QMU, and I'll switch over, and uh, I have, this is the Hammerhead VM. So uh, in the lab, in the, in the VM that the students get, um, we have a, a QMU folder, and when you switch into that, you'll see folders for each of the of the virtual machines. The QMU tools has uh, different scripts and tools for starting up, starting up or creating additional uh, ARM-based VMs if, if you wanna do that, make some on your own. Uh, so if we go into the dogfish folder, there is a start dogfish script. So if we run that, That's going to kick off booting up the Dogfish virtual machine inside of uh, Hammerhead. This is a new ARM-based VM that's starting up um, within this. And we can interact with the console. Uh, we can SSH into it and uh, just kind of uh, interact with it freely. So skipping back to the slides, uh, that's what we have starting up right now. We have this Dogfish VM that we're going to work out of. And um, the, the goal for, for this part of the presentation is, is how do we then uh, emulate a router out of that? And how do we 
get it so that we can interact and launch exploits and look for bugs in this router. So we're going to do the Netgear and uh, there's a few components that we have to get before we can get started. Uh, the first uh, component is the file system. We need to know uh, what files are gonna be running on that Netgear router. So we gotta grab that. Um, and to do that, we can extract that from the vendor's update bundle. Um, what that is, if you've ever updated your router at home, there's you go to the vendor's website, so uh, Netgear's website, and you pull down the update, you browse to your router's webpage. Uh, usually they'll have um, some links so that you can update and they want you to upload into that. And you push, you, you upload this file and it updates your firmware. Uh, instead of doing that, we, we take that update bundle and we extract the file system out, out of that. And we do that using a tool called Binwalk. And we talk about how to do that in class. Um, but doing that during that process, we, we can grab out, we can pull out all the files needed to start up the Netgear router in an, an emulated environment. The next component we need is NVRAM. That stands for uh, non-volatile random access memory, um, but it's just referred to as <clears throat> NVRAM. This is stored in flash. Uh, it's persistent memory. So when you turn off your router and turn it back on, it's you're still gonna have that memory. And if you think of a home router, um, some of the things that you would wanna keep uh, when it turns off and turns back on are your IP settings, your your passwords that you've changed, your wi wireless SSID, your wireless passphrase, things like that. So configuration gets stored here. Um, <clears throat> To, to get this, uh, we can log in if you have uh, a target device, and usually if you're doing research on one, you want to get it, uh, get one and kind of get your hands on it. Um, but with the Netgear, there, there's a backdoor to get Telnet access. If you have the password, you get a, a shell and you can extract the NVRAM from, um, from memory that way. And once you have, the NVRAM, we're, we're going to save that to a file. And then with these two components, the file system and the NVRAM, that's, that's all we need to um, start up this emulated device. All right, again, we have a new blank slate. We have where we're going to uh, start up our Netgear emulation. <clears throat> all right, right now we're inside the Dogfish VM as represented by the smiley face. Um, we're we're either logged into the console or SSH into there, and we can we can look around. Um, now the next step, the next thing we need to do is cheroot or change root into uh, the Netgear file system. And uh, this is kind of a, a complicated slide, but I wanted to kind of break break it down a little bit, and you can have this for a reference, if especially for those who haven't used cheroot before. Here, if you look at the numbers on the left, uh, the command in number one, I'm listing out Netgear root FS. So what that is, these, these, this is the extracted file system from the Netgear device, and it's just all, all extracted into a single folder. So this, these are the files that would be pushed onto the device if you were to push an update onto it. So this is the file system, this is the first component, we have that. So what we can do with that is cheroot. Um, <clears throat> so we use sudo in the next command, we use sudo cheroot, and then we give it the folder name, and then we execute a command. So whatever that command sees uh, will be in the context of that folder that we give it being the root file system. So that command is bin sh, so that just starts up a shell for us. And that's what we see uh, as we come down into the third command. Uh, in the third command, we're now cherooted, so we've changed root into that Netgear root FS folder. So it looks like we're on the file system that should um, be pushed onto the device, but we're gonna use it for emulation. 
if you do a command like ls forward slash, um, instead of seeing what you would normally see at the root of the dogfish VM, uh, you see that you're looking at the root, uh, which is the now for us, it's that Netgear rootfs folder, right? So um, this is kind of, I think, the most complicated piece if you haven't seen it before. But as an overview, the little smiley face, it's kind of like Neo in the Matrix, right? When he plugged that thing in the back of his head, he went into the Matrix. So he was no longer on the Nebuchadnezzar, um, so no longer in the Dogfish. I, I probably should have named that that VM the Nebuchadnezzar, but too late now. But he's he's now shifted into the matrix. So we're in the matrix. When we look around, we see the Netgear file system. Um, this is a Squash FS. It's a compressed Squash FS is a compressed file system that's used a lot for uh, pushing these out to embedded Linux systems. Um, <clears throat> that's what it uses. But for our intents and purposes, we're just looking around in that folder. One thing to note here, the, we're still using the same kernel that the Dogfish VM uses, um, which in this example is a newer kernel, but it works fine uh, with our exploit. But uh, we're just now, th at this point, we're looking around at the file system as it would appear on a Netgear device. All right, and instead of running bin sh, instead of just running that script, we're going to run, or instead of just running bin sh, the binary, we're going to run a script. So this is the a Netgear boot sh script. Uh, this is, it's a pretty, pretty short script, but the idea is to automate this for the students so that they don't have to, you know, type in all these commands, but it is kind of cool how all this works under the hood. So that's why, that's why we're talking about it here. So instead of just executing a shell, we're going to, we're going to kick off this script. So let's look at the different components of the script. There's a, a sleep there at the beginning and another sleep at the end. Those probably aren't really necessary. I just have that to uh, kind of get bearing when the script starts up and, and make sure other processes have completed. Um, the first thing we do uh, in this script is we, we mount a couple of special file systems. The, the proc and the sys file systems, we, we get those mounted because when we boot up Linux inside this emulated environment, it's going to look for that. Uh, forward slash proc allows us to um, save information about processes as they start up, and forward slash sys allows us to save um, system information and configuration as Linux starts up as well. So, <clears throat> Figuring these pieces out to get the emulated device up and running, this is kind of where the challenge comes when you want to do something uh, new, right? Once you get the file system and the NVRAM, um, it's, it's a lot of trial and error to getting this stuff to, to start up. Uh, we also make a, a dev null device. Um, we do this because uh, when Linux is booting up this um, particular, Netgear setup, it's looking for a dev null device. And if it doesn't have it, it'll cause a problem and with our boot. So this again, this was trial and error, seeing what was causing it not to boot, and then creating this device in the script before we kick everything off. All right, so so we get that stuff set up. Uh, the next step involves uh, loading up the NVRAM. So <laughs> This is stored in a text file that looks like this, looks like what you see in the, the middle of the screen. It's a, a setting equals a value, and it's just a bunch of settings uh, just in a text file. <clears throat> but we need to load all of this so that um, one of the things we don't have is flash memory in this emulated environment. And when, uh, when Linux is starting up, it's it's going to look for flash memory, but we don't have it. So we need to we need to trick it and make it think that it has all the settings it needs so it can read and write to NVRAM. So that's why this step is important. All right, so these two commands we're going to look at in the next slide. 
Um, the first is setting up some environment variables. Um, <clears throat> if you look at number one on the far left, the first part of those, those two commands is we're using a technique called LD preload. Uh, this technique uh, in Linux allows us to load up some shared objects, uh, some libraries <clears throat> that will set hooks and it will intercept calls um, that these libraries uh, know how to handle. So what that means for us is when we're when uh, the emulated system is trying to read NVRAM and write to NVRAM, uh, it will uh, instead hit our hooks and we can um, handle that instead of having to have the flash and the hardware, we'll um, use our interceptions and read and write to these values to memory. The second part of the command, if you look at, at number two, is just a script that takes a file, the nvram netgear.ini file. It's just a text file that looks a lot like what we saw on the previous slide. Uh, this setting equals this value. And it just goes through a loop and loads all of that into memory. So um, it's taking all these settings and pre-populating in our emulated nvram so that when the <clears throat> router is starting up and it's looking for these settings, uh, when we intercept, we can say, yes, we already have these, these settings. So um, these .so files, uh, I did not write these. These are from uh, Samil Shaw's uh, GitHub repo. And we'll look at that on the next slide. He has a lot of really cool stuff. The, the um, script um, is similar to a script that he uses as well. I had to tweak it a little bit to get it to work in, in our particular environment for the lab, um, but it's it's based on, on his work. He has um, a, a repo called Custom NVRAM, and it has the, the source code for, for these. Uh, Nighthawk is the, uh, the product line for the Netgear router, so um, this is available on um, from this custom NVRAM repo that he has available. Uh, in addition to that, if you are looking to do um, some of this em emulation and you want to do a, uh, if you want to use a, a larger framework, he has, if you look up uh, ARMX, he has a, um, this is a, a big framework that um, has a lot of this stuff um, built in and he documents it really nice. And also uh, there are um, <clears throat> presentations that he's done if you're interested in, in kind of a, a larger framework uh, that, that does kind of a lot of this. All right. Um, so definitely, definitely check out ARMX and uh, Samil's work. It's really, really great stuff. All right, going back to our process here, uh, we are almost there in our setup. Uh, the next thing we need to do, uh, we have a sweep command in there, probably not really necessary, but the next thing we do is sbin pre init. And I use an ampersand to run this in the background and I have bin sh after that. The bin sh isn't really necessary here as well. Uh, it will just give us a shell uh, within this window. Um, so that we can type commands in the Netgear emulated environment as well. But once we execute this pre-init command, it's going to kick off Linux booting up and it's going to start uh, additional processes and services. And um, eventually the web service will, will also start up and then we'll have access to the um, Netgear routers web interface and some of the other network uh, interfaces that we want to attack. Uh, this class isn't uh, web exploit development. It's not uh, SQL injection and, and other things like that. We're, we're attacking the backend binary. So we're doing um, binary based exploitation, but we access it through uh, some of the network based services. So we need it to get um, booted up all the way. So that's how um, that's how the 
the whole process works kind of at a, at a high level. Um, the scripts for um, the Netgear and the D-Link that we use in class are very similar. Um, they're, they're pretty short and pretty straightforward. Um, the, the challenge is when you, when you first start um, trying to get this up and running, there are some pieces that it's, it's just not booting for some reason and you have to troubleshoot uh, why that is. <clears throat> and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, kind of toward the end here um, when we look at the um, some of the things I learned when booting up the Netgear. So if we switch back over to the Hammerhead VM, we'll take a look at that. <clears throat> you see that we have uh, Dogfish already booted up. I'm going to open up. We can work it at it uh, in this console, but I'm going to open up uh, a separate window. Uh, right now we're in Hammerhead. We're not in Dogfish, but we can SSH to it. And this just gives us uh, a little bit more freedom because I want to I want to use that console in a minute to to kind of see uh, some log messages when the router is booting up. All right, so we're in the Dogfish VM. We can verify that we are in fact looking at an emulated ARM environment. All right, so uh, for all intents and purposes, we're, we're running on ARM within this Dogfish VM. So uh, what we want to do now is kick off the Netgear uh, emulation. So uh, looking in the home folder of Dogfish, uh, we see uh, that Netgear rootfs is the extracted file system uh, that we we pulled out of the update bundle that we talked about previously. Um, to get Netgear started, um, all we need to do is launch the script. And I have, I have those uh, two second sleeps in there. So after a few seconds, this should kick off. And what's happening here is this is the NVRAM uh, getting loaded into the emulated environment. So that's uh, that load NVRAM script. And right now it's loading all of these settings so that um, so that the router knows, knows these settings when it starts to boot up. All right, as this is happening, this takes, takes a minute. Uh, there's one other thing I wanted to point out uh, going back to the slides. <clears throat> What's really cool about this and setting it up this way is that uh, within the Dogfish VM, since we're running this in a uh, emulated environment, we still have access to uh, all the different processes that are running within the emulated environment. So <clears throat> from within Dogfish, we don't have to create GDB server stub to copy into the emulated environment. We don't have to copy GDB into the emulated environment. Uh, we can run that from within Dogfish, and we still have access to those processes, um, and we can do live debugging on these vulnerable uh, services that we're attacking. So, um, <clears throat> so what we do in some of the labs is that we connect to um, the vulnerable service, and we launch our exploit, and then we can see uh, we can walk step by step through the memory corruption and look at the stack overflow and walk through ROP change, chains and, and see how we gain control of execution. So being able, being able to debug is um, really nice when you're, you're working with uh, these emulated devices. You can still do that on a target device, but you have to cross compile uh, a binary, get and copy the binary over to the target device and, and set it up that way and <coughs> access it over the network. So it's doable, but it's much easier in an emulated environment, which, which makes it really cool. Um, let's see, switching back to Hammerhead. Um, 
right now we're in the the dogfish vm um it looks like it ran these are all all of our um nvram settings it looks like they've been loaded up and this is the shell at the end of the script so i have access to kind of just inner commands this is in the the netgear file system in the, the netgear environment uh, the errors that i talked about i'm going to switch over to another tab this is the the um, going back to the login prompt we had for dogfish and we see a lot of errors uh, scrolling by and we see a lot more errors as it's starting up because it's just it's looking for hardware that it doesn't have and all these different uh, types of services that it, that it can't find because it's not running on the actual device. But like I said, that's fine as long as we can access the the target services that we are interested in. So with that, we can open up a web browser. Uh, we have Firefox here in this Hammerhead VM. Uh, <clears throat> another thing with SANS, uh, this is pretty cool if, if you haven't taken a, a SANS course before, but but the workbook is included in the um, VMs. So uh, that's pretty pretty nice. Uh, they It didn't have this kind of when I was uh, getting started years ago, but it, it's, it's pretty nice to have um, in here. So all the labs and everything are, are in here, which is sweet. All right, next we want to browse to the Netgear router. And again, everything is self-contained. Um, it's given a, a designated IP. Um, and we get a login prompt that might be a little bit hard to see, but uh, when we log into the interface, you'll be able to, to see it uh, more clearly. <clears throat> so, so here, this is all running uh, out of that Dogfish VM. And it's it started up. Um, there are some things that are missing if you kind of really go over go over everything with a fine tooth comb in the web interface. Um, but for the most part, uh, a lot of it uh, can be seen here. Um, one of the examples, if if you go to the the downloader, uh, there's it says no USB drive. I'm not uh, emulating a separate USB drive, so it's not finding that. So there are little little tweaks and things, but um, all the services for us to attack are here. And we can do that um, from the Hammerhead VM or even from the, the Dogfish VM, we can attack this uh, Netgear emulated router and launch our exploits against it and, and uh, debug it and all that good stuff. So just as a recap, again, these are the kind of the, the high level components of uh, really just four steps that we have to do. Uh, we shroot to the target file system that we've extracted from the, the update bundle. Uh, we mount these special file systems that we need and we create dev null. We use uh, LD preload and then use a script to, to populate our uh, NVRAM so that we have all the configuration we need. And then we basically hit go. And when we launch, uh, in it that will kick off the Linux Linux startup and everything will begin to to boot up and eventually the web services will start up as well and then we'll have access to uh, the web interface and all the the other um, services that we want to attack so uh, with that uh, one other thing before going into any questions that we have are uh, just a, a troubleshooting tip because um, like I said it's it's a lot of trial and error to get a new router up and running but um, uh, once you do I mean you can script it but one of the things I ran into as an example with this Netgear um, <clears throat> was trying to get it started initially um, so the commands on the on the left, one, two, three, if you look at number one, I'm starting at this point, I've shrouded into the Netgear rootfs environment and with Linux, uh, typically you run in it and that's what kicks off uh, Linux starting up, the operating system starting up. So when I run this initially, like nothing happened, it just 
sent me to a a prompt uh, again. So that was that was kind of weird. I knew I had to kind of figure out how to get this thing started up. So I did ls l uh, to do a long listing of this file, and I saw that it was just a symbolic link to another binary file called rc. And um, looking at so then I tried to run rc from the command prompt. And then it gave me this usage example, as you see in um, number three over there, uh, you know, run it with RC start, stop, restart, or WLAN restart. Now, this was all, all kind of weird. And, you know, so I, I knew I needed to kind of figure out what's happening and, and what I need to do to kick this thing off and have this thing boot up. Um, <clears throat> so I took uh, RC and opened it up in Ghidra. Um, Ghidra reads and ARM binaries fine, ARM elf binaries fine. So uh, I took it, took this file and looked at it and saw something interesting in the in the main function. Uh, it's a little hard to see on the left, but on the right you can see it's it's kind of a zoomed in um, display of what's what's being shown on the left. There's this stir stir uh, call which is comparing the input, this is the command line input, it's comparing that to pre-init. So when I was trying to start it with init, it was failing this check and it wasn't starting up. Uh, there are some additional checks in, in this main function. You can use RC, you can use erase, you can use write. So there, you can start this up from the command line in a couple of different ways. But if you use pre-init, on the command line, that's what will kick off the normal Linux startup. And I had to just kind of look at this main function and, and kind of uh, just looking over it, it kind of gave me kind of an idea of which path I needed to take. And it showed me I need to use pre-init from the command line. And I would have not known that, um, you know, just looking at just trying to run things within it, you know, how it normally would start up. So, um, so using that, that's why sbin pre-init is added to the beginning of the startup script. And that's how, once I did that, everything kind of fell into place and, and started up uh, cleanly after that. So I just wanted to kind of give an idea of some, some of the, the headaches, because this, this took longer than uh, like the two or three minutes it, it it took to kind of explain uh, what I did, but I wanted to show you some of the things you need to do to, to troubleshoot and get this stuff up and running when you're doing something for the first time. So all that being said, uh, are there any questions on the router emulation piece? All right, uh, we don't have any questions built up right now. If you do have some questions for John, please go ahead and enter them. In, in the meantime, John, I'm I'm curious for the audience. Um, uh, you referenced the um the uh, um the real Samuel uh, Samuel uh, GitHub, which I put the link in the chat. Any other resources, just in terms of ARM research or ARM testing, maybe not even specific to exploit um, development uh, for uh, for people to take a look at. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so again, this uh, ARMX framework is great for the emulation. Uh, what I do is kind of smaller scale, just uh, scripts, but uh, this is great for the emulation. I have uh, another tab open, uh, Azeria, Azeria Labs is really awesome. She does uh, phenomenal, phenomenal work. Uh, there's even some like posters available with a lot of the ARM uh, commands and syntax. Um, I highly recommend uh, her her work on here. Uh, they this is uh, tutorials uh, on uh, writing ARM assembly. There's a lot here. She has tutorials on exploit uh, development and talks about different. Uh, lab environments. So there's really just a ton, a ton here. I even have her poster um, hanging up. So uh, this is probably the, the number one resource. I, I really think highly of her. And I think she does a lot of really great work that she puts out there for free. 
Uh, and I'll go ahead and ask just in terms of, I know this is a brand new course uh, and uh, um, we're just getting through uh, um, the beta runs and uh, we're going to be moving over to live here uh, with maybe any small updates, but uh, any thoughts on like sort of the, the future of this kind of course or this kind of uh, exploit development? Yeah, yeah, good question. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of different things you can build off of this. Um, two days is probably, uh, it, it's um, pretty tight as far as fitting all, all of what we have uh, just within the labs. Um, I, I think I gave you a time of, of two to four hours, but uh, I got a, a message recently about a student who's, who's taken this and kind of been working on it and kind of studying some of the labs in depth for, you know, a couple of weeks. Um, but but there's a, a lot of material here to kind of play with. So right now I feel like it's 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 even bigger than than the two days. Um, but getting around some of the um, the uh, exploit uh, mitigations, like kind of getting more into the um, uh, the memory leaks and kind of kind of building on that, putting in uh, additional <clears throat> devices. That's something I would uh, like to do with it. Uh, to kind of further build out this course, um, maybe further down the road, looking at um, not just stack exploits, but some overflows on a heap. So there's uh, a lot of different places this this can go. Um, and also these, these fundamentals that you learn in this course do um, play over and transition well into some of the uh, more difficult targets that have a lot of the secu ARM security features turned on and that are, are just kind of um, all there, like understanding understanding how to work at this uh, kind of low level that we go at in this class kind of builds out into the more hardened features and kind of um, having this fundamental knowledge uh, allows you to take this a little bit further on your own as well. And uh, you just touched on mitigations there. Uh, just curious, is there is there much in the way of mitigations for um, uh, for ARM technologies out there, stuff that people can look up or look into? Yeah. So um, in the embedded uh, devices we looked at, they did have uh, ASLR turned on. Um, so that was <clears throat> that's a mitigation that that we we talk about and we kind of uh, work on um, in in kind of kind of toward the end in the memory leaks but uh, uh, ASLR uh, stack canaries um, non-executable code segments of the stack not being executable different data sections not being executable that's kind of pretty common uh, out there um, some some embedded uh, systems a lot of embedded systems I would go to say don't uh, enforce all of these, but all of these in combination make things a difficult target. So um, looking at how to circumvent these type of protections are um, are definitely some things you you'll need when when looking at uh, more hardened targets. Cool. I'll, I'll just mention that we do have a pretty good uh, blog write up uh, from Security 660 about uh, Stack Canaries that's on the SANS blog site. So uh, probably cool to look up in conjunction with some of this info. Uh, it looks like we don't have any questions right now. So I think we can go ahead and wrap up. Any parting thoughts, John? Uh, no, I uh, just um, hope you like the course. There, there's a there's a ton. If you do end up taking it, there's a ton of uh, really good material and we go pretty pretty much into uh, good depth we get we get down in the weeds with it so I really think it it's a, an enabler for um, work doing this kind of work and, and taking it further so thank you for your time today I appreciate uh, all of you guys uh, tuning in Awesome. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks very much for the cool presentation and, and bringing the content to our community, uh, to our audience. We greatly appreciate you listening in, as John just mentioned. Uh, I'll also say for a schedule of uh, uh, all upcoming and on-demand SANS webcasts, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Uh, so until next time, take care, and we hope to have you again for the next SANS webcast. Bye now. Thank you.